When shopping for car insurance, consider this. GEICO has been saving people money on car insurance for over 75 years. So if you're serious about savings, it's simple. Go to GEICO.com. After 75 years, they know how to save you money. I think you guys will really dig this. Nate Boyer, uh, Green Beret, Special Forces, United States Army, three tours of Afghanistan and uh, Vietnam and Iraq. Um and uh, played uh, football at the University of Texas, but never played football before he tried in college. And I'm very proud to put this up today, Monday, uh, because over the weekend, Nate Boyer became the long snapper. He signed with the Seattle Seahawks. So uh, it, it's just it, mind blowing, mind blowing how cool it is that this guy left Afghanistan, went back to the University of Texas and said, I'm going to make the football team. Let me see. Long snapper. Yeah, I'll try it. Uh, you'll dig it. Fascinating guy. And uh, he, a little slow to get going because I don't think he's used to being on his heels uh, the way I ask him questions. But just an incredible story. Nate Boyer, long snapper, Seattle Seahawks. And this uh, was recorded a week ago before he knew he was going to be pulling an NFL check. Way to go, Nate. Thank you for your service. And now make sure you snap the ball the right way, buddy. All right, there's some more stories, people. Let's go. Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game tape. Donuts. If you want a battle, it's either that you will or you won't. Hey, you know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Hey, man. Ready? Uh, more stories podcast. Uh, pick up your mic there, Nate Boyer. Nate Boyer, my man. Staff Sergeant. I'd call you sir, but I know you work for a living. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that like, uh, that's what they it's always say. in the face. That's what they say in the army. Right? <laughs> yeah, if you're a yeah. sergeant and somebody yeah. calls you sir, it's like, whoa. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Nate Boyer is an army special forces uh, guy. Uh, Green Bray is the slang. But also, you have to, you know. Also, Nate Boyer, uh, well, I'll, we're going to get to the story. It's pretty intense. And uh, Nate Boyer was the long snapper at University of Texas. You got to hold that mic real close to your uh, face there, buddy. Where were you right before you came here? Just now? Yeah. Uh, I was at my internship getting, cof- you know, getting coffee and picking up lunch. And Can I ask uh, you a question? <laughs> How many tours of duty did you do in Afghanistan slash Iraq? Uh, three total. So three tours. Why are you getting coffee for anybody? <laughs> we should be handing you coffee and fanning you and uh, having Filipino <laughs> women feeding you grapes. Well, that's that's coming. That's soon uh, on the horizon. But yeah, I had to. Uh, you got to put your time in, no matter where it is. You know, you got to go back to to the beginning, and I'm you know eventually want to uh, you know work in the film business, I believe. And so I'm interning at. Uh, a place called Film Forty Four. It's Peter Berg's production company. Good dude. And yeah, great guy. Great director. Great director. And good, a good person. You know, big veteran supporter, much like you. Uh, funny guy. Not quite. Not quite Jay Moore funny, but you know, oh, he's funny. Is, That's on. true. Good point. But yeah. So I mean, so you wait, gotta, if you, you want to get somewhere. into the film industry, you took a very circuitous route. Three tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. <laughs> You join the army. You're in Texas. You, I mean, why not just uh, go to University of Texas and go to film school? Uh, I kind of wanted to, but I really wanted to play football, and it was pretty much impossible to do both. I wouldn't say impossible because I guess people have done it, but uh, I tried to do it for my graduate degree. I tried to do the film degree, and uh, they told me that you know, I, had, I had the best references you could have. I had great grades, and you know, I thought I had – Pretty interesting background, and uh, but they said no because on the weekends you got to film stuff, and you know we got football games in the fall. It's a tank. This is Nate's tank. Yeah, that just went by. No, <laughs> just I'm put it around the back. I'm talking about before you joined the United States Army. 
Uh, you knew you wanted to be. Oh yeah, no, school. I wanted to go to film school then. Yeah, it's yeah. expensive. And instead, you decided to serve our country. <laughs> right. Was yeah. There, was was it because of nine eleven that you decided to go all in, or was it after that? Yeah, I mean it, that's where it started. Honestly, when I went to yeah, walk the listener through the okay. whole thought process of where you got you know to you know right. basic. Okay, so um, I was living out here. You know, after high school, I went down to San Diego and had no idea what I wanted to do, but. I knew I wanted to work for a living and, you know, earn my keep and I wanted to work outside and have, you know, do some sort of manual labor and just feel like, you know, a man, I guess. And so I, I got, I, I weaseled my way onto a fishing boat as a deckhand and did that for a while. And, uh, it was fun. It was crazy. You know, we'd go out in the hundred miles out, uh, offshore and, uh, you know, catch albacore and tuna and bluefin and whatever. And, uh, and then I moved up here because I wanted to go to film school, and it's expensive. I wasn't going to ask my parents for, for money to go. And so I just didn't, didn't really go. You know, I was living here, and I was partying a lot and uh, just doing odd jobs, really no direction, had no clue still what, what I really wanted to do in this business. And, uh, and then 9-11 happened, and it just completely flipped my world upside down and totally changed, uh, changed my thinking on things and kind of got me thinking outside of my bubble and I guess more globally, and uh, eventually that led me to the Darfur in in Africa, and I did some relief work there for a couple months. And while I was over there, is where before I gained. Before you were in the army. Before the army, yeah. So when I was there, I, I, I so I tried to get on with an NGO to go over there. I read this Time Magazine article. NGO stands for uh, non government non government organization. Yeah, everything's an acronym in the military. So right. Help yeah. Us yeah, out. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's like uh, Doctors Without Borders yeah, and yeah. Child Fund and whatever. So I called them all, and they were like, you know, you, you got to have a college degree, and it's like a six month vetting process. And all like, this stuff. I'm trying. I'm like, I just want to help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want that too one day. Yeah. But I mean, I was like, I, I'll. I just want to get over there. I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever. I just, I'll fly myself over there. You know, I just want to help out. And, uh, yeah, they, they just said no pretty much. So I said no. And I applied for a visa through the consulate through DC and just like sent it in the mail and said I was going over there with some organization that I wasn't going with. And they sent me back my passport with like a visa sticker on it and I was good to go. So I went and bought a plane ticket for Darfur for the Chad. Yeah. It's a country next to Sudan. Yeah. And where all the refugee camps were. And I just flew there. And then I weaseled my way onto a UN flight and flew to the refugee camps and helped out for a couple months. <laughs> I don't think people, in, I know for a fact, people in this country have any idea how, I only know about it through reading books. Um, what a concept. Uh, how I'll when you go to there. those refugee camps, it's, it, it makes you question like the entire human race and what like how people could suffer the way the suffering you saw right uh, especially in darfur and uh, do you, do you get to the point when you're working with the un with refugees in darfur and there's like an insurgency in chad and these weird border wars and these drug wars do you ever get to the point where you think to yourself i've been here six months nothing is helping at all or uh, do you see personal like stories of triumph in those places yeah i mean that's kind of that's kind of where my want to join the army came from honestly and i didn't know that was going to happen i went over there you know, thinking I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to save somebody. I just, I, all I want to do is save one person and really help some, you know, help people. over there. And I go over there and, you know, most of the stuff I did was I, I assisted in the, the medical centers and I, you know, I played with kids and just spent time with people. You know, there was, there's no Americans over there. It was all, all the, all the people working over there were either locals or they were from, um, from Belgium. Most of them, you know, everybody's, it's a French speaking country. So everyone's speaking French. And so this American shows up, I had like this seersucker coat. And uh, just these khakis, and I had nothing. I had like a change of underwear and a toothbrush and uh, malaria pills in my bag, you know? And it was just like, who, you know, what is this guy doing? Who is this guy? But then they found out I was an American, and they just, oh, man, they just gravitated towards it, you know? They all wanted to hear about America and how amazing it is, and, you know, they just were like, oh, it's so great you come here. Did George Bush send you here? You know, and all these things. I mean, do I you know like, George Bush? Yeah, do you know George Bush? Yeah, you want we to? Like this, we love this George Bush. You want me to call him? <laughs> we love this man. It, it, was, it was just things you didn't expect to hear, you know. I, I kind of was under the impression that uh, it may be really dangerous for me, and maybe they're going to, some of the people there might, 
you know, hate me because I'm American or just that, that jealousy or whatever. But I never felt that at all. It was like generosity. Did you see uh, drug lords like struggling for power of the UN stuff? Because, I mean, uh, Black Hawk Down, historically, we went in there. Clinton sent everybody. You know this already. Right, yeah. We went in there because the drug lord, uh, lords in Somalia were taking all the UN supplies and right. starving the people. That was their power. So we went in to save everybody, and uh, shit went south in a hurry. And to his credit, Bill Clinton went... Everybody out. Right. Not wanted, not needed. So right. long. Right. Have fun. Uh, did you see drug lord stuff going down when you were working with the UN in Darfur? Um, I didn't firsthand. So what was happening there really was uh, it's this militia called the Janjaweed. And it was basically, it's just a genocide. It was just an ethnic war, you know. And these, these, these people would come into this, these guys would come in on horseback in these villages and they would like rape all the women and, you know, maim the, some of the kids. And either kill the, the fathers or, or, you know, or, the, or the dads would escape and end up fighting anyway. And, uh, and then they would just burn the village to the ground and leave. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. You know, I, I wasn't firsthand on the front line seeing that happen, but I saw the, the, uh, the after effects. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I'm, these kids are like missing limbs, you know, and their faces are all cut up and they're it out there. It seems to be a big thing in Africa, taking off a hand or a foot. It's, yeah, it's crazy. You can curse, by the way. I, I see you uh, <laughs> choosing your words carefully. Let fly. This is okay. the internet. All right. So you're in Darfur. You're doing uh, relief work uh, in a refugee camp with only one other American. How do you then go into the United States Army? So, yeah, it's like the end of my trip over there. And I'm like, I, I just wanted to keep helping somehow. And I didn't know exactly how or what but like i said i kind of gained that patriotism over there and just a, an appreciation of who i was in an, as an american for the first time i was really proud of that you know um just because of the way they looked up to me and i even met got young men over there young you know chadians and sudanese that were like i wish i could join the army the american army you know like i want to i want to join the army because you guys go to these countries and you you know you help people like us that you know, can't fight for ourselves and blah, blah, blah. Plus you eat three hots and a cot and you eat yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you get citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so yes, there's that, but I mean, they were, yeah, they were just like, that was so, I don't know. I mean, they were, they were interested in that. It wasn't just what they would get. It's just what kind of we stand for. At least that's what they told me. Maybe they're, so you, maybe they're good. You have, a, you have a self, <laughs> you have, you have a feeling of self and uh an identity of self once you're helping people you want to continue to help people you want to be of service so you go to a, did you just walk into a recruiter's office it's exactly what i did really I, yeah i came back here i came back here and i was like okay i want to join the military i don't know what i want to do exactly though and then i i picked up another magazine uh because it was saying something about special forces on the front and i read this article i was in like a car i was getting my oil changed or something i've been back like a week maybe and i read this article about uh they're starting this program where you can come in off the street and if you pass all these evaluations like psyche eval and uh, intelligence tests and language aptitude and like physical exams, then you can get this contract to come in to the army and after basic training in airborne school, you can go right into special forces selection, which is a long shot to make. But if you make it, you can start training to be a Green Beret like right away without having to do regular army time. And, and then I read about how the special forces work with indigenous people. You know, and everything we do is like we're fighting alongside the Iraqis or Afghans yeah. that are trying to, you know, rid their country of terrorism and develop. And so that just inspired me because it wasn't just I didn't just want to join the army and go blow shit up, although I love doing that. But that wasn't <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the only thing. I mean, I, I wanted to really feel like I was making a difference for these people. Right. You know, And so it just it just struck a nerve with me. So you become a uh, Green Beret. Yep. OK, so let's fast forward. Where were you when you learned by hey Nate, wake up. We're on the move. We're going. Where was your first stop? Iraq. Yeah, Iraq. Yeah, I. I uh, after my training, I got. Uh, excuse me. Sand. I just had sand blowing here. It's uh, it's ambient sand. As we talk about Iraq, Sudanese, we had some mud. So, where did you? Where were oh, you? Oh yeah. Okay. Call? So, so I. Finished my training, got my green braid, and they sent me, like, a few days later, I was in Okinawa, Japan. That was my first... That's where my father was. This whole, really? Yeah. This whole that was my first... Uh, thank you. That was my first duty station. And so I get out there, and they're like, hey, uh, you know, you're going to go to the Philippines for a year <laughs> and uh, work over there, because we're neat people are needed over there. 
And it was more like a kind of a training mission, I guess. It's still considered a deployment, but I was like, man, I want to go to Iraq. I want to go to Afghanistan, you know? I mean, that's why all of us joined. Well, yeah. most of us anyway. And uh, so, yeah, I, I tried out for a different unit that we won't speak of. And uh, oh. I made it through selection and okay. uh, and went through their training course and learned so much, so much, like, I mean, it was unbelievable. It's just you're just shooting every day, and you're doing all these. This unit that we can't speak of—is there a number in it? No, there's not a number in it actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm fascinated. Like, wait a minute. I know a lot about the military. Wait a minute now. You know, we'll talk about it offline. All right. <laughs> but uh, so I get through, you know, most of the training, and they're like, "Look, you know, you need to get a deployment under your belt before you can come back and work with us." You know, and I was like, good. The like, guys that can't be named. Yeah. You you got to go get a deployment. Before yeah. You can really be one of them. Right. Okay. And I was like, perfect. Like, yeah, well, I, that's what I want to do. That's yeah, why I'm here. Gonna deploy me. Yeah. So they sent me to a different special forces team that was leaving in a month for Iraq. And so, you know, I, I went there with all that training I just received, which was awesome. Because even though I hadn't deployed yet, you know, I, I received a certain level of respect from the guys in the team just because. I'd had that, that experience over there. And a lot of them, that's like what they aspire to do eventually, you know? And, uh, yeah. So I went, I went to Iraq and like a month and it was just first day. I mean, do you, I mean, do you just land at like Iraq, uh, international airport or whatever it is? Uh, no, like that airport, there's a funny story about jump that, out the back of the plane in the middle of the night. When I, when I, when I went to Afghanistan these last couple summers, I did do that. I flew commercially in and out of the country what? by myself. Yeah. And I just get out. I get off the deployment? plane. Yeah, I get off at at, at Man, the Kabul, good. the Kabul International Airport. I bet that's a real gem. And I, <laughs> I bet baggage claim runs real smoothly. Oh. <laughs> Kabul International Airport. It's amazing, actually. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of uh, single file lines. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's Sunni not. Sunni baggage. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, carousel number one. Yeah, it's just a. Uh, so you go to just... Iraq, your first deployment. Are you shitting bricks? Are you fucking terrified, or are you more like I've trained so much? Let's get going. I, I don't know what's expected of me, but whatever it is, I'm down. Let's go. Yeah. No, exactly like that. Let's fucking go. And what was the first deployment? You no, I was, I was when psyched. When you were in Iraq, what was the first? Did they put you in a tank? Did they? Were you in a Humvee? Were you on foot? Uh, what, what was we your first? We were pretty much always in Humvees at first deployment, like almost everywhere we went. I mean, we dismounted quite a bit depending on what you were doing, if you're clearing buildings and stuff like that. Um, so we're going after like high-level targets. You know, we call them HVTs, high-value targets. And so we basically build these target packets on these guys um, through sources that we have through Intel from higher and people that are in our area. And so we like basically track them, um, you know, and, and try to go capture or kill them. And you'd run their missions at night, you know, but during the day you're training the Iraqis or the Afghans, whoever you're with. And you're like, you, you know, you live, live with a lot of them on this camp, you know, it's just, yeah. a, it's just a 10, 12 man team. Um, and yeah, you just, you, you eat with them half the time and yeah, then you go out, uh, you go out on the missions with them and you're going after like certain people, like certain individuals. You said clearing houses or clearing buildings. You said it very off the cuff, but I don't, for the listener, you need to realize clearing houses or what do you say? Clearing buildings? Yeah. Right. Uh, there's a high value target that may or may not be in here, but our Intel tells us the guy's in here. So you and nine other guys, uh, have to walk into a house where it, it might be just a family of five sitting on a carpet, watching, uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. That's what it eating. is nine times out of 10. <laughs> yeah. But how that's that shit terrifying when you're sitting at home and all these guys, cause you guys look like you came out of the movie Tron. Let's be honest. Like the gear we have now is I'm being serious. Like the gear we have, it's night vision. You're all wearing goggles. You're all talking in walkies. You come in, get on the floor, get on the floor. If that's not a high value target, right? You've just made five people hate the United States of America. I mean, I'm this, I'm talking real with you. You know where I stand with our, with our veterans, right? But that's gotta be when you leave those houses, uh, because it was bad intel or whatever. Is there a part of you? I know you, Nate. You're a good guy. There's got to be a part of you where you're like, that was fucked up, man. Those yeah. poor people. What do no, you get? There like, definitely you is. Sorry? I mean, you feel you do you you do, you do say sorry, and and you know a lot of times, uh, the military or the government will do something to repair that. 
You know what I mean? I, we even do that with like car accidents over there. I know in Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, so much of the military is paying the villagers. Like they come to you guys and go right. like, hey, that last bombing raid, I lost two cows. <laughs> and then you go up to the captain's office and he's like, just we'll give him $40. 20 per, and Which is like they, two months pay for them. Yeah, and they haggle. <laughs> yeah. And like you got to decipher who's like making shit up and who's not, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It really I mean, there's a lot of that. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, your first firefight. What? Tell me. What happened? Uh, and by the way, uh, Nate Boyer, here's a little surprise. He's the long snapper at the University of Texas football team. At 32 years old, he taught himself how to long snap by watching YouTube videos. Oh, what'd you think? We were just going to go USA all day? We're going UT, baby, too. <laughs> he's fascinating. That's why he's here. Your first uh, firefight. Nobody, you know, Hemingway wrote, it's one thing, I think it was Hemingway, it's one thing to speak of bulls, it's another to be in the ring. Like, we all read these books, Generation Kill, Jarhead, and they do a really good job explaining how crazy it is and sound leaving your ears and all that stuff. But, I mean, tell a guy listening right now on the subway in Brooklyn, what was your first firefight? What was it? What happened? Well, the first one for me was uh, the truck in front of me in a, in a convoy was ied basically, you know. Improvised explosive device. Yes, exactly. And uh, it was, you know, ex- it, blew up you know what i mean i mean luckily in that vehicle that time that time uh nobody nobody died which was amazing but you know it was the first thing for me i mean i'd, I'd seen my very first week there i'd i'd, I'd uh was like qrf which is quick reaction force for uh a humvee that been that been hit and the driver was killed instantly and so we're like we get on the scene we're like pulling security and trying to clear the area and find out, you know, who did it, whatever. But this was different because it was the first one that was like, almost hit me. You know what I mean? The, and, the, uh, the truck that was in front of you. Yeah, the truck that was in front of me. So I just feel this, you know, you feel this shockwave. Anybody that's in that situation knows, I mean, that, that happens, that, that, that blast. You feel alive. Oh, you f- yeah. suddenly realize I'm a living person and this I mean, could end. <laughs> you know, it's right. like shooting, you know, it shoots, shooting gravel at your face. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you feel that, that, that shockwave. And I you know, I can hear pieces of shrapnel and whatnot, like, hitting our Humvee, you know, and then just seeing the one in front is just a giant, you know, exploding cloud and fireball basically. And, uh, yeah. And you feel that like shockwave and you're just, your yeah, ears are immediately ringing and, uh, and all hell breaks it's weird. Loose. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 a it's amazing. All chaos. hell breaks loose yet. You guys are so trained. Everybody with all that panic flowing through your body, you know exactly where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do. What stance, what crouch, right. what position you're supposed to be in outside of the Humvee. Uh, we train them up pretty well. No, they do. You know, especially especially the, the elite the... units like that. Um, well, let's talk about my last one. <laughs> oh. so my last one was it, was it was just literally just a couple of weeks before I came back to play football this, my senior year. So this was just last summer. And uh, it's kind of surprising to people because a lot of people think, well, at least I thought at that time, uh, we were kind of done in Afghanistan, you know what you know, I mean, with the fighting. Getting told that it's been. Yeah, done. yeah. And uh, I don't think they, I mean, I left in early August, and I think in September or October they kind of slowed down the offensive stuff a lot, like maybe even stopped it completely, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, so this is in this is in July. And, uh, you know, we're going into a village where we're no, we know we're going to receive contact. Like, we, we just know. Cause it's Why just, were you going in the village? Um, because there's basically, you know, guys bedding down there, uh, there's bad, bad guys, guys there yeah. waiting yeah, to kill a lot Americans and we're going to flush them out. Exactly. Okay. Because I mean, they go, you know, they got their safe havens in their areas. They go because they have a lot of support from the villagers and, uh, it's a tactical location for them for whatever reason. And, uh, Hold on real quick. And I'm sorry to the listener, but we got to get these sponsors in. listen to these commercials. And then Nate Boyer is going to explain his last firefight that happened last July. You got to be kidding me. The Stanley Cup playoffs underway on the networks of NBC Universal. Watch every game every night on NBC, NBCSN, CNBC, and USA Network. It's the Stanley Cup. It's here. We get to watch it. You can stream the playoffs live on the go with the NBC Sports Live Extra app. Don't miss a moment. Every game, every night. Don't miss a moment. Don't miss a goal. Don't miss a check. For full schedule and more info, visit NBCSports.com, NBCSports.com. Why am I shouting? Because it's the cup.
Last week, Julie Carroll posted a status that read, Just had the most delicious banana ever. It got two likes and four comments. Well, Julie Geico also wants to make a comment. What if we told you in as little as 15 minutes you could save hundreds of dollars on your car insurance by switching to Geico? With those hundreds of dollars, we bet you can find another banana equally, if not more delicious than the one you had last week. Hashtag go bananas. Hashtag savings. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Okay, so you guys sweep into this village because there's guys in there that are uh, embedded and you know they're bad guys and you got to sweep them out. You got to go on the offensive yeah. and you got to flush them. Yeah, so we're we're basically just, uh, it's just a patrol. It's a presence patrol is what we call it, you know what I mean? A show of force. So we're just cruising is through. Show, I'm interrupt a lot probably because I have so many questions. Is the show of force, is the mentality that when they see the armor and the armor, you know, the, the personnel that... These guys are just going to go, eh, you know what, this isn't a good place to hide anymore and just kind of leave and go someplace else? Or are you hoping they stand up and make themselves targets? You're talking about me or the government? <laughs> well, let's do both. <laughs> I mean, for me, uh, yeah, we want them to fight. We want them to, 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 to do exactly what they did. You know, they, uh, they massed in a building and uh, prepared to unload on us, which they ended up doing. And, you know, we got in a fight. And that's what we, that's honestly, I mean, you're an SF guy. Uh, us and the Afghans we're fighting with. We were with these Afghan commandos. I mean, they want to they wanna get after it, too. I mean, that's it's what you're trained to do. So you show your presence. Yeah. So they leave their... They, their is their presence in the building that they start firing from? Yeah, it's this, it's this big village, basically. And we had, you know, ISR, the video feed from above. Yeah, way and up. It's, yeah, and it's showing us... It's showing us where these people are moving, you know, where they're, what building they're going into. So we knew what building they were, gonna, they were, they were heading into. And we're cruising through there. It's it's just you know the twelve of us are our SF team, but in addition to that, it's uh, you know fifty, sixty Afghans and their vehicles. So you know it's a larger contingent, and and so we're yeah we're just rolling through on the street, and then all of a sudden you know they open up with like mortars and uh, you know all their automatic weapons and everything they had, and just hit us with everything they got like instantly. And so you know we obviously returned in fire, and it was just. An entire afternoon like that, you know, and we unfortunately lost the Afghan captain uh, that was leading that unit uh, in that firefight. He was like right next to me when it happened, you know. Really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was I, I. I talked about it with you before. I think when I, I, I went back. There was a lull in the in the fighting, and our radio gun out. So I went in in the tailgate to uh, you know, to fix the radio to reload the the crypto that had dropped, and uh, and a sniper started firing right at me. And so I grabbed the you know, the gun that was sitting there at the, on the tailgate and just started, you know, firing back in the direction where I saw the muzzle flash. And then it just kicked off again for a few hours, you know. I mean, that's just how it goes. So That was your afternoon. That was my afternoon, yeah. Wow. I mean, it's fun, though, in a way, you know. It's, it's, I don't know. It, None <laughs> of us know. That's why you're here. But it, it, it's just, just because you... You've been trained to do that. It's like a firefighter. You know, who, nobody wants to see if somebody's house burned down. Right. But I guarantee you when a firefighter, when, a, when, a, when they hear it's not a cat in a tree, you know, there's actually a fire, they're psyched. You know what I mean? And they get that adrenaline and, yeah, yeah. and it's what they're trained to do. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, and you want to you wanna accomplish your mission and you want to get as many bad guys as you can and preserve as many of, you know, the American lives and the Afghans you're fighting with as you can. And... Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's weird to say, and people are going to probably crucify me for this, but it's like a game in some ways, you know? It's like a sporting event, like a game like that. At and, uh, Nate Boyer 37, light him up. <laughs> Here it comes. But I mean, I, you know, and, I, and I'm not, no, you know what? I'm not a I war love, junkie or anything like that. But no, that's just, I just love that you're being honest because yeah. I've known this just from the other vets that I've spoken to. And it is like you wait around, you wait around, you wait around, and you wait around. And then that muzzle flash goes off from some weird uh, building. And it's on. It's yeah. like finally, this is why I joined the army. Right. To right. beat bad guys. And it's not a game like Call of Duty. <laughs> no. <laughs> At all. I've you been asked die. that question before. It's, yeah, very it's a lot like Call of Duty, except you could die. <laughs> there's no respawning. And there's no, uh, oh, let me get an extra life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, look, there's food over here behind this. Let's pick it up. <laughs> you, let me play devil's advocate for you. Okay. Um, if we had never gone to Iraq or Afghanistan, there's no threat to the United States of America at all. But it, we'd already been attacked, though. By Saudis. 
I'm asking. I'm playing. I'm <laughs> playing liberal lefty douchebag. Okay. That's going to come at you about this right. stuff. Right. So Iraq didn't attack the United States. There were no weapons of mass destruction. Okay, but those people are still being oppressed. Those people in those countries. You know, whether we go or not, they're still being oppressed. And so while we're over there, at least a soldier's mission. I mean, we're over there. We're trying to. We're trying to help these people, and we're trying to. Sorry, I got bug bites on my feet. <laughs> you good? You know, we're we're essentially uh, we're trying to, to 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 rid this area of terrorism. You know, and uh, yeah, these these people these people are oppressors. They're they're uneducated and they're not allowed to be educated. You yeah. know, and I think that's the key. Oh, it's in, so much of in it is. the counter argument that you're making. They're not allowed to be educated, right? And if they have no if, choice. They have no there freedom. There's no threat to the United States. You know, it, I always, anytime I waffle on whether or not uh, we should be involved in other people's business, I always go back to JFK's inauguration speech. Let's pick up the freedom for all. I've, I don't, we'll look it up or we'll post it someplace. <laughs> but it's essentially like, you know, people always go like, well, we shouldn't be the police force for the damn world. Yet everybody, so, all, everybody on the left is so goddamn in love with John F. Kennedy. John F. K Kennedy's inauguration speech was we're going to pick up the torch for freedom for those that can't help themselves we're right. going we're going it was basically we know now he started the green berets and our a, and our motto is de oppresso libera which means to free the oppressed yeah and, and then, it was a precursor to run up to vietnam we know now uh which got started before him prior to him with eisenhower right. but it, it's this thing there's very bad people in the world and what do you do do you let people be oppressed or do you go and flush out the bad guys and uh you know i mean that's that's what I believe. I mean, I, whether you're going there as a military or you're going there by yourself, if you're going over there to help the people that can't help themselves and you're doing the right thing at, at any level, and that's like including the Peace Corps or whatever, it doesn't have to be uh, fighting wise. But yeah. I just, in my personal opinion, uh, you know, when you have a gun in your hand, people listen a little better and uh, actually pay attention to what you're saying. And, and when you're over there, risking your life for these people and alongside these guys, you know, they respect that so much and they realize that, that how serious you are, you know, you're not just dropping off a bag of rice and leaving, you know That's what I mean? That's the UN's job. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. We're, we're there for <laughs> those weird white trucks they have <laughs> yeah. weird armored white things. Yeah. Were you, uh, when Toyotas. they, when, huh? They're all Toyotas. <laughs> are they all, really? Oh yeah. All of them. That's amazing. Yeah. You would think they'd buy American all the goddamn aid we send <laughs> across the globe. You have some Cadillac UN vehicles. That'd be tight, man. That would be pretty nice. Spinning rims. Just <laughs> yeah. Blasting little Wayne. Yep. Um, Lowered. Do you, when that Afghani, uh, nice. When that Afghani captain. Afghan. Afghan? Iraqi and Afghan. Okay. Yep. When the Afghan yep. captain yep. was shot and killed on uh, your last firefight, was that right. the closest you ever came to being killed? Yeah, because, of, I mean, that time, if you don't cast, if you don't count, you know, I guess IEDs and. I mean, I've had random uh, stray bullets, I think, that have, you know, I know that have come really close to me. How do you know? But, I mean, I saw where they hit, you know, or heard them crack right by my head. But in that, in, in that day, I had a, there was a sniper that was trained on me, you know, and he was, I, I mean, because he was hitting everything around me. And it was like one shot at a time. So it wasn't just this stray stuff, you know, and it was getting more accurate. He was walking the rounds in, you know, because yeah. he's out there. He doesn't have a scope or anything like that like we do you know he's got iron sights he ain't bradley cooper he might be he might be <laughs> the real bradley cooper <laughs> the real one that's how Who bad knows? a shot he was <laughs> yeah he, he pulled the trigger and you know hit everything Virginia. around you but you yeah so where was the afghani captain uh, like uh, excuse me the afghan captain how how does he fall if you went to the back of the truck uh, so he he was uh he was bounding between so we had basically we're on a road perpendicular to where the fire is coming from you know okay. and we're setting up our trucks to, you know in a position where we can suppress the most because we have 50 cows on the top of our trucks you know so it's just these big automatic machine guns you know and we're just firing to you know from where the contact's coming and or to where to you know what i'm trying to say we're firing at i'm firing at the contact where the contact is coming from <laughs> yeah the bad guys I'm with you. <laughs> so uh but he's trying to control all these Afghans, because they don't all have radios like we do. You know, with us, we all have communications. Each guy in the team, 
is listening to whatever each other's doing. It's really easy. It's a lot easier for us to control each other. And even in, in a firefight, even with us, that's difficult because there's so much over. going on. Nate, clear my line of vision. Right. It's exactly. That, yeah. You're that, giving that, distance that, and direction yeah. where you're at, where you need someone to be. Yeah. If you need a medic, you know, you call for him and he comes with these guys, you know, the captain's got a radio and a few of the other guys. Um, but a, a lot of a, arm waving. Yeah. It's a lot of yelling yeah. and it's just chaos. And so he was trying to control his, his guys and, uh, he was bounding between the vehicles, you know, moving and somebody just took a good shot and just hit him, you know, or hit him right in the neck. And he just, a unfortunately, shot meant, a shot meant for you. Possibly. I don't know. I mean, he well, was, you said uh, the, the guy was trained on you the whole time. Then. Well, there was, I mean, there was, I think on that mission, we, there was 30 KIA. So I don't know which guy hit there was him. 30 Afghan a- enemy, enemies yeah, killed in action. Right. Yeah. So there was probably dozens more than that. You know, that got away or... And how many of you guys... Told, we have the 50 Afghans and how many Americans? 10, 11. Wow. Yeah. So you don't, and so. you don't know who ran out the back of the building. Yeah. And that, oh, exactly. That's what would bother me. How many ran out the back door of that building and set up somewhere else? Is that still... You're yeah, not... I mean, so I'm looking at never, a guy right now where it bothers you when you sleep at night. Where the fuck did never, that one guy never, go? Oh, there's tons is there of the, them. Yeah, how, is there, is, I was never, say, you never get every single guy. No, of course. I was going to ask you, is there the one know, that got away? But for you, it's probably the, the 100, 100 that got away. Yeah. Yeah. Three tours. Yeah. Uh, hey, if you're uh, shopping at Amazon... What a weird uh, <laughs> segue. <laughs> Tell me about your last firefight. And hey, everybody, make sure you use the Amazon banner at jmore.com like our friend Jake Clarno. What up, Jay? Listen to the Pete Holmes cast while buying more of my favorite Volcom board shorts via your Amazon tab at jmore.com to replace the ones I am currently wearing assless on Maui. Yeah, Morrier to the core, bro. Aloha's. That's from Jake Clarno. If, you use, uh, if you're going to be shopping at Amazon, don't go to Amazon. Go to jmore.com. Hit that Amazon banner. Basically, Nate, Amazon just wants to know that you got there through my website. This guy's in Maui wearing assless uh, board shorts. Is that that's really a thing? Well, it, that's why he had to buy new ones because the asphalt. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I want to know what were you doing? Yeah, I was spacing out for the first part of that. Well, that's okay. It's an ad <laughs> in a way, but all that money goes to my son's college fund. I don't see a penny of it. It's great. Nice, it's fantastic. <laughs> so and uh, so, kid. thank you, brother, for helping out so much with your Amazon purchase. You, you uh, and, and by the way, why don't you thank Nate Boyer? You're th- that's why you're in Maui with assless board shorts. Yeah, you son of a bitch. You know what? <laughs> you email you big keyboard uh, warrior with your assless Volcom shorts, buying new ones. Prick. Why do you thank Nate Boyer for his service once in a while yeah. at Nate Boyer 37? Send me some Volcoms or whatever. Yeah, they send are. Nate some shorts. He needs it to go to film school. <laughs> you realize there's going to be a movie made about your life. It's inevitable because Nate Boyer, uh, again, as I said earlier, and I'll let you talk a little about this. Uh, are you going to play me? Third. Oh, that'd be awesome. But I'm pretty sure Marky Mark's got this part rolled up. You know who you look exactly like is Jim Mora, UCLA. You look like a young Jim Mora. Nice. Nobody's okay. ever told you that? Uh-uh. Yeah. Nate nope. Boyer looks just like young Jim Mora. Yeah. Ooh. Sam Worthington, I'm getting. Keep him coming. I like this. Corey R. Bird up. <laughs> you look like Eddie Collins. <laughs> no, an inside joke. <laughs> stand up No, dance. I don't. Well, if no, I do, don't. I'm getting out of here right no, now. No, you don't. Don't worry. <laughs> it didn't take. Um, the the fa- There's going to be a movie. You're aware of that. You have to know that... There had to, you, some conversation about a movie made about your life has to have hit your ear at some point. Yes, but you don't. You're not comfortable <laughs> talking about it. I'll paint. The uh, I picture. mean, no. It, 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 honestly, so I, I kind of fought fought this kind of thing for a while because I had you know some people approaching me about doing a book and stuff like that, and I don't want to write. I can't write my own book about. Them. I'm not going to say I did this and I did that, and I'm not. That's I'm not taking I, shots. That's on, the only. That's the only thing I can write about. I mean, I got two books. All I wrote yeah, about which was funny. Then I walked in here. I don't think anybody wants a firefight to be funny. They just want to know what happened. Well, that's my point. If it wasn't something else, besides, it's because it's about, you know, that I'd have to write about, you know, the stuff that I did in the military. Like, and yes. I'm not ashamed of any of it, but no. I don't want to be like, you know, no shit there. I was more bullets in the air than oxygen and all that stuff. Like, even if it's, you know, not because I, I wouldn't write that, but I just feel weird because there's so many soldiers out there that have these stories and veterans and I'm not special or different than them. I just ended up playing football afterwards. Yeah. So it's not like I, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not a, a Chris Kyle or Marcus Luttrell. I don't have that crazy story. I'm not going to make something up. You well, know, your story's pretty crazy. I mean, the it's fact that you do yeah. a tour in Iraq and two tours in Afghanistan, is it correct? 
Right. Yeah. And then you realize, hey, you know what? I really want to go back to college, University of Texas. And uh, you wanted to play football. You've never played football before in high school. Right. But for some reason, you like almost, I mean, not almost, like an actual crazy person. <laughs> University of Texas kind of known for football. Yeah. And yeah, they won go, a few championships. You know what? I'm going to play football for the Texas Longhorns. Well, how long? What's your experience? None. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. Yeah, to them. Said, oh, I know that. <laughs> and then you figured the only position that you really had a shot at was uh, long snapping. Right. Which is the guy, when you punt the football, there's the guy that has to snap the and ball. And field goals and extra points. And field goals. Uh, yeah, the 15 okay. yards you snap to the kicker and or punter. Right. Well, no, or. Not and 15 or. 15 yards to the punter, 8 yards to the kicker. All right. To the herd. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just straightening you out, me. man. <laughs> so. Sports you, guy. You go to Mac. <laughs> Brown, who was the head coach at the time at the University of Texas. And you're what? You're 30 at that time, right? Yeah, I walked on at 29, almost Already 30. Already this yeah. is – like if you were never in the military in hundreds of firefights – uh, this is already a, like a movie. Like, eh, I'm 29, 30. I think I'll try out for the Univers University of Texas football team. Nah. Never played football before. <laughs> How hard could it be? <laughs> Apparently, it's really fucking hard. Yeah. Because people, uh, you know, hand in uh, SATs written in crayon, <laughs> and people turn the other cheek uh, and turn the other blind eye to it. But you, Nate Boyer, you go up to Mac Brown, who, by the way, uh, if you're not familiar with Texas football, He's he's the he's not there anymore. It's Charlie Strong. Mac Brown is the guy. Like Joe Torre was with the Yankees, like Bobby Bowden was with Florida State. He is the man in Texas. Yep. And you have the balls, the temerity to approach this old the man. The audacity. The audacity. <laughs> now see now we're writing a script. The ignorance. The, and, and, th and thank God the ignorance. Yeah. To walk up to Mac Brown and say what? Um well, I'd already I, so I so I'd made the team. Uh, just the strength coach, you know, a strength coach. Hold on, let we me missed, let we me try a step out here. I Hold thought on. you went up to. Okay, go well, ahead. I went up to him about the long snapping deal. All right, how? Who did you first approach about playing football? For the the strength team? strength conditioning coach. His okay. name's Mad Dog. Okay, Jeff Madden. What was your name in uh, the army? What was your nickname? Malibu. Malibu? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you what did you listen to? Certain music on? Uh, what was your? I listen, it was Malibu because of the American Gladiator Malibu. If you haven't seen this guy, oh, we've seen him. Look him up. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've seen him. Yeah, you know that clip, we'll that famous YouTube Tumblr, clip. Oh Jay my Moore god, thirty-seven. Uh, that thing what, gets me going. What music would you uh, insist on being played on a, a patrol? You personally? Well, I didn't listen to anything on a patrol, so. Uh, got, but if I could have a, it would probably be. Uh, I mean, probably some Motley Crue, okay. something like that. You're shaping know. up the back end of the podcast where we play you out too. <laughs> okay, yeah. Can we, can, I don't so know. you know a, the strength and conditioning coach for the University of Texas. I do love meatloaf. We ain't playing meatloaf. Come on. Let me sleep on it. Okay. Baby, baby. <laughs> Let me sleep on it. Let me sleep on it. Yeah. It's a good I got to know right now. So you go up to the strength and conditioning coach, Mad Dog. You know him how? Just from working out I just, like a loon? No, I literally walked up to him. I had my, my uh, BDUs on, my uniform. And uh, I just went up there to visit here. the school. Yeah. And I was okay. like, if I walk around in this thing, I'll probably be able to wander onto the field and walk up around there. I don't think that was your first thought. If I walk around in this thing, I'm getting so much pussy. Let's be anyway. honest. <laughs> Let's be honest. Eddie Collins. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what I did was <laughs> Why did that make you uncomfortable? We're talking about Kitlin action and you're like, eh, I don't know if I want to talk uh, my about My mom might listen to this, you huh? know. My mom might listen to this. Highly unlikely. Uh, yeah, it's probably true. Your mom's gonna get on a computer, she's gotta download the More Stories app. Yeah. And we're Mrs. pretty far Boyer, into this thing, so Mrs. Boyer, it is free. <laughs> well, no, you're thinking about were you you know, hey, I'm looking at me in my uh my dress. No, uh, no, no. This was before I even got into the school. A lot of chicks. I'm walking around on campus. It was the summer. Chick, chick, it dig, was summer. It was empty. Me, right? It was empty. Oh, okay. Fair I'm enough. just being honest. I'm being honest. All right. So I, I I uh I tracked him down and just told him that I was getting out of the army and I wanted to try and walk on, you know. And he just asked me, you know, what what'd you do? I said I was in the special forces. He's like, Okay, yeah, well I'll try out, you know, then it's it's first week of school and this and that. And so I, yeah, I tried out basically just a conditioning test type stuff and uh, made the team. And then I met coach Brown. I feel like we're the glossing first game. over a lot of stuff that people might find interesting. Like, Worked uh, out, blah, 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 made the team. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like you had to do 14 chin ups and they're like, you are now a longhorn young man. 
<laughs> no, no, no. So, but you didn't have a position. You didn't. I mean, what was no? Your so this is so. So it's it's before I made the team. Before we Did you actually play high had, school football. No, I didn't play anything. I never right. played football. See, I never played a snap. I'm bringing you back to the, st- okay, the narrative. Okay. We're writing a book via okay. podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I played touch football in my front yard growing up, but that's Eddie Collins. It. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, just watch uh, whatever. Yeah, it's just, a joke from my stand-up that Nate particularly enjoyed, <laughs> and many of you already have. All right, so you see the strength and conditioning coach. He tells you when the tryouts are at the University of Texas. The University of Texas, one of the most storied college football programs. And on my radio show, Jay Moore Sports, we narrowed down the list of must-coach colleges uh, to six. Uh, USC, Texas, Alabama, et cetera, et cetera, Notre Dame. You have to coach it. It's it's that prestigious. Yeah. And they say, yeah. Uh, Mad Dog says, yeah. Just come on this day. And what's the workout? If you don't if you don't know how so, to play football, okay, so how did you work out? It was basically the first day was this. The first day was everyone went out on the field, and uh, you know this is the season after they just lost the national championship to Alabama. You know, Colt McCoy got hurt in that game, and uh, they lost, so they're second in the nation. You know, which is as bad as being last almost. I mean, it just hurts, Acceptable. you know? So, yeah. so we're out on the, they come out to the field and he's like, all right, everybody, you know, you got to run six laps around the field. All the O linemen run four laps. And, and, uh, so he just guys. said, yeah, the fat guys. <laughs> <laughs> so he just, uh, he said, go. And, and it was like me and, and 15 other walk-ons who had, we'd done some conditioning stuff before. And they said, okay, you can start tra- working with the team, but you're not on the team yet. You know, you have to like excel, with with the the current team uh to make it so we're out there and like i'm wearing like white you like, have to excel t-shirt. with the hopefuls you know with the guys that are already on the team oh like the team okay, okay. so they like throw us into the fire pretty all much. right great and so uh it's the whole football team and so they start he says go and they start you know jogging and all the other walk-ons are kind of you know they're trying hard but they don't want to like show anybody up i guess or they're just worried or they're just not fast i don't know and i just like sprinted six laps around the field which is about a mile i guess and i lapped everybody and i, I lapped the old linemen that were doing four laps and just finished as fast as i could like i was you know dying at the end but i was whatever i'm gonna finish this thing it's my one shot it's my one shot i'm these like I mean, they're evaluating us they're, right now these guys are slapped dick and i don't yeah. know why they're wasting their yeah, me and one other guy made the team out of those you know 15 wow. that went with us but so at wait, the end of it mad yeah. dog comes up to me and he's like uh how old are you and i said 29 and uh, <laughs> that's guys. Yeah, first of all, Mad Dog like, right there went, oh yeah. man, why couldn't you just throw in a nineteen at me, like a twenty nine? So everyone gets done, and he gathers us all around, and he like chews out the team basically for sandbagging because that's so I made everyone look like shit, and I was like, so hey, I was hated. Yeah, I was hated early on. It's all good though, and uh, not really, but I'm sure some people were like, motherfucker. But uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, so I had a good good uh, idea that I'd made the team at that point because From he had running me, six laps. He had you, me break. You, he had me made... break the team down to USA on three. <laughs> oh, after the six laps. After the six laps. So yeah. he doesn't even know that you didn't play high school football. No, they never. No, no. They just never asked you. No, they never asked. You were blissfully ignorant. They were also blissfully ignorant. Right. And if had they maybe asked. On that first day, they would have went, yeah, but he never played football before. So this thing just kind of keeps inching forward because <laughs> nobody goes, do you know how to play football, mate? Yeah. If they had asked I mean, you that, you would have went, I mean, I watch it on TV. Yeah, I know I mean, what it is. Could it be? I know what it is. I've Pope seen one of these laces, things. Right? I, yeah, I got this. <laughs> so next step, what happens? So then uh, then we, you know, practices start after we did this, some of the conditioning stuff and the in the first day I, I was a wide receiver. I was like, well, I guess I'm a wide receiver. I don't know. I'm I, at the time I weighed about 180 pounds and, uh, or maybe less, maybe 170. Then I was five eleven, one seventy. 170. Yeah. Nice slot receiver. Perfect <laughs> prototype. <laughs> right. Yeah. White guy in the slot. That's Texas gold. Right Just there, runs man. a four, nine 40, yeah. you know, <laughs> four, nine, my ass <laughs> lapping six, six laps. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I go out there and I'm running around the first day and catching balls. And one of the safeties comes over to me. Uh, who ended up being one of my best buddies. He had a lot of Marines that were in the military with him, or family that were Marines, sorry. Yeah. And uh, so he just respect, you know, just respected me instantly just because of that. And um, he's like, dude, you're not a wide receiver. 
you know. And but how did you? He know he, which he way knew to he run? knew I hadn't played. He's one of the few guys I oh, kind of okay. said it like I never played he before. Didn't you have to help me though, out. But how did you even no. know on that first practice when they said, "Okay, Nate uh, Boyer, wide out." Just uh, go. This guy. This. Just go last. Just go last in the oh. little and do what everybody else just did. Okay. See, that's something <laughs> you know? I never would have thought of. I just yeah, I just sat back and observed and waited for my for the right time when I knew when I knew exactly what I was supposed to do I'm gonna for that drill. It like I know what, yeah. exactly what I'm doing. Fake I it watched till you make eight it. Guys go before me. Yeah, Fake exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I See, did that, and uh, and and, and, the and comes over. Yeah, Blake comes up to me. He's like, "Dude, you're not a receiver. You're a DB." And I was like, "Defensive Why? back guy yeah, covering yeah. wide receivers." Yeah, he's like, "Because you want to hit people." And, you know, you want to hang out with us. This is DB. Texas is known as DBU. You know, so you want to come. You're a DB. Trust me. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I'll teach you how to backpedal. And I was like, all right. So, yeah, you, like in our off days. Special forces, you don't backpedal very no, well, do you? No, no, no. So he would, he would teach me. He no taught sergeant, me in like my off time. <laughs> Nate. Take the shit seriously. I'm <laughs> I take joking. serious shits. What? <laughs> <laughs> so he teaches you the finer arts of being a defensive back. Yeah. Uh, not How the, long did that last? <laughs> the basics, basically. Uh, so I played that first, you know, the first year and a half there. I was a, I was a DB. I mean, I didn't play, but so I was on the team. The I was on the scout as, team. Yeah, a scout team. And safety. no one still had anybody asked you, "Have you ever played football before?" Or were you that good at no. faking it till you making it that you were making? I don't think Coach Brown knew yeah. until I don't think after I started long snapping. <laughs> I don't think. I think he just found out when he listened to this right now. I don't think he is a big fan <laughs> of the podcast. I, I don't think Coach Brown knew a lot towards the end. <laughs> With all respect. Yeah. No, no, he, dude, he's, he's amazing. He's the man. Yeah, I'm, I'm always going to stand up for Coach Brown. So, so you're a prick. You go from def- <laughs> I am a prick. You go from defensive back uh, and you wind up being a long snapper. So who, who tells you uh, – And because that's got to be a weird thing for you uh, going to Darfur. I mean, look how far we've come in this conversation. You know, right. We started from a Full cat circle. that wanted to help America and help others. Not America. You wanted to help others. You went to Darfur to help people you never met. To don't just, look to like you. Different color there. than you. Started in Darfur. And now I'm just a selfish guy that just no, wants to play not football. True. There's many things get, off uh, mic that Nate said. You know Let's please not talk about this because it looked like I'm talking about myself. And I respect that. But Nate is uh, beyond fascinating than you could fathom. So defensive back, who – it's got to be a weird job to go up to the guy. Do they know you're an Army uh, Special Forces guy at this point? The guys on, like the coaches and everybody? Everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They know All at this right. point. So who yeah. has the job? Go tell the guy with special forces, <laughs> with blank, you know, notches in his belt, whatever, uh, which don't worry, we're not going down that road. Uh, go tell him he has to switch positions or he's not good enough to even be on the scout team. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, no, no. somebody had to play Grim Reaper. <laughs> no, one did, no, no one did that. I chose to switch to long snap because I want to get on the field. Um, but I do have a funny story about that kind of, so we had a new, we had some coaching changes after my first season there. Uh, coach Brown was obviously still there, but there was new assistant coaches and, and one of the guys, uh, I hadn't met him yet and I don't think he had any idea, you know, that I'd been in the military and all that stuff. And I, it was, I was doing scout team and I guess he wanted me to, it was on two days before the game. We do like a walkthrough thing. And for that, we're kind of shadowing the receivers and stuff and, they want us to kind of get out of the way and let them catch the ball. And they want us to go to a certain spot because that's maybe the look that team might give, even if it seems weird to go to that spot. So if you're not a sports fan, scout team, what you do is let's say you're playing uh, Alabama. What you do is what Nate would do and the other guys on the scout team, you would look at film of the University of Alabama defense, and then you would basically imitate that defense so that the Texas offense could make believe they were playing Alabama in preparation for that game exactly. so that by the time you're on the field, there's no surprises. You've seen these looks through your scout team practices. Right. right. Yeah, so, exactly. Right. That's it. So during the scout team. So during guys, that, he, <laughs> I, I did what I thought I was supposed to do and, and kind of went to this area and then the, it was a bad pass and it, you know, was intercepted by somebody or something because the quarterback didn't want to throw it to my area. Cause I was where I wasn't supposed to be. Apparently. I don't know. The story, the point of the story is the that coach comes out, comes out to me, and he's like, you know, give me your fucking helmet, you know. And I took my helmet off, and he put it on his head, and he stands back there at safety, and backpedals out of the play into the end zone because I guess that's what he wanted me to do, which was nowhere near the play. And he's like, that's what I, that's what you're supposed to fucking do, this and that. And uh, I just kind of stand there looking at him, and he's like staring at me, and you know, continuing to just curse and yell at me he takes the helmet off he's probably 10 yards away from me and he just drops it on the ground 
and then walks away like staring at me. And I just, I was starting, my blood was boiling and you could feel everyone else around, all the other players were Awkward. like, oh shit, like uh -oh. Nate's going to snap. Malibu's, and, uh, Malibu's, <laughs> Malibu's <wanted>. coming out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he's just walking away and I'm standing there just not going to pick my helmet up. And the, and the <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the graduate assistant coach there who's a ex-player, you know, uh, who's in school now helping. He's like, Nate, Nate, get your helmet, dude. Get your helmet. I'm like, I'm not getting shit. And I'm just standing there and then he's walking away, walk staring, staring. And then eventually I just, I had to walk over and get it, but I just walked slowly. If you didn't get that helmet, him. you never would have been a long snapper for Texas. Well, maybe not because after practice, he came up to me. He's like, I, I had no idea. I guess somebody talked to him. He was like, <laughs> like Bro, sorry, Steph, yeah. Sergeant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, you almost died just then. And he was like, he's like, uh, oh, I, I just didn't. And I was just like, it's all good. But So you want to get on the field. So you teach yourself to long snap. You figure that's the path of least resistance. Yeah. It's just, there was an opening at that position. Um, we had to get the starter and this backup were graduating. And, you know, I, Played, played baseball and pitched before, so it can't be that different. I'm just throwing a football no, instead of a baseball <laughs> through my legs instead of overhand. It can't be that different. How long did it take you to be confident enough to show it to the University of Texas? Like, watch this, guys. Just like two months. But, I mean, I did it every day. I did like 100 balls a day, and I was just like anal Sounds about hot. it. I did 100 balls a day. I 50 said, dudes. And you said anal. <laughs> you said I did 100 balls a day. And I was super comes. anal about it. <laughs> Eddie uh, and Dallas. then you look, I watch University of Texas football all the time, uh, you know, and I never really saw a fucked up snap the entire time. The two years that you were there. Is there one? Three you remember? years. Three years. It started for I only watched the yet. last two years. And then, three years. <laughs> oh, ago, the first he, year, every single one was over his head. That's not true. <laughs> no, it's not. You're right. Um, <laughs> the website you told me about on my radio show and I want the listeners cause the podcast listeners, it's appointment listening and they'll go where we tell them because they like what you and I like. You told me a statistic that blew my mind, and that is there's 22 veterans kill themselves every day. Yeah. And when you told me that, I said to you, I don't know if you remember, I said, if you told me 22 Americans killed themselves every day. I already stole that line from you. I've already used it. Good. I love that. Please continue to use it. If you true. came up to me and said, did you know 22 Americans kill themselves every day? I'd say, that is, we got to stop this. 22 veterans kill themselves every day now the website you gave me was 22 kill 22, 22 kill kill com. and the yeah. number is 22 kill.com and you can make a difference and help and a lot of time these guys don't get medication they need there's what nate uh brought to my attention when he was on the radio show is a lot of the time it's just swallowing your machismo and just simply sitting down with a psychiatrist and, or so uh you know and a just counselor. saying a counselor, a counselor and yeah. saying I got these weird feelings, man, and getting shit off your chest. But as yeah. men, we're so macho, we think it's uh, we're being pussies if we don't ask for help. There's nothing more manly than saying, I give up. I need help. Yeah. And it's not giving up, though. Not in the sandbox. Giving up is killing yourself. Side. You know what I mean, though? Really. Yes. So it's not. Yeah, it, no, it's right. giving in. It's giving in. Yeah. You know. And, and asking for help is manly. Yeah. Because it, it takes such courage to admit, I can't do this on my own. You're going against right. thousands and thousands of years of a caveman fix-it ug yeah. mentality. So you're going to walk into some nerdy guy's office and go, yeah. I had a dream the other night where I choked out my, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a whole thing. Right. 22 veterans killed themselves a day. And you had made that. You, I should have talked about this way earlier in the podcast. And They're still uh, listening. The SAR, 22kill.com. 22kill.com. Why is it, Nate, in this country, everybody always says, support the troops, and anytime some shit breaks out, there's yellow ribbons all over every tree, every street you drive down, but when they come home, I see them outside 7-Eleven sitting in their own urine, wearing Carl Malone Laker jerseys. Why is it when you guys come home, we just tend to sweep you, like, thanks for your service, later. If we see you in the airport, fully dressed, in camos, and we're like, hey man, thanks. Wow, thank you so much. Why, when you guys come home, all of a sudden the blinders go up and we don't want to know about it? What is that disconnect? It confuses uh, me. I mean, because it's probably a little bit of fear from people uh, that maybe if they really do reach out, um, you know, they're just not going to relate or not going to understand this guy because they're probably not, honestly, uh, at first. I mean, anyway. like civilians reaching yeah. out to a veteran yeah. in a tough time. Yeah, because it's not, I mean, thank you for your service. It's, uh, 
It's great to say that, you know, and, and how does it, it, how it, is it for, how amazingly, is it hear, how is it to hear it? I, you know, I appreciate it because I know how hard it is for people to do that sometimes. If you're walking through the airport and somebody just passed you set and you're in your uh, camo, somebody goes, hey, man, thank you very much for your service. Right. How do you feel when you hear that? No, I feel I feel I feel prideful. And then when you when you have Probably doubts, a little embarrassed too. uh, you personally, I don't I don't, no? I don't really feel embarrassed. I feel it's more like I, I just want to tell them like, OK, I, like, thank you. I don't do this because it's it's kind of awkward, but I want to tell them thank you. But you know what have you what have you done to really show that you're that you that you appreciate our service? You know what I mean? Because thank you, they're just words, and and it's it's amazing to me how hard that is for a lot of people just to say that. And like like so, I do appreciate it because I know it takes people. It's cur- courageous for someone to say that. I don't understand why because I'm just not like that. I mean, but what have you done? It's just words, but yeah, but what have you done? What I have think you that's done the whole, that's that? the sentence of the podcast. You know what I mean? And, 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 and I'm, and I'm not talking show? about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go donate $20, $20 to it, to a, to a nonprofit. You know I mean? Do that. Yeah. Do that too. But do that too. But I mean, like, are you reaching out to these guys and are you hiring them, you know, at your job? Do you, do you, are you giving Huge. them an oppor- opportunity? You know yeah. what I mean? Just because they went a non-traditional path. Are you giving them a chance? You know what I mean? Is that a problem with soldiers returning? They're having a hard time getting hired. Yeah, it just. I think a think, lot of. Them, I would think as a business owner, those that's the first guy I want. In there's my a building. lot of people that do, so I shouldn't take away from those those people. No, you're there's not. a ton of asking, people that is do. Is there actual? Uh, is that a situation where a lot of guys that have served have a hard time finding work because of the? Yeah, I think so, and and it's not just finding a job; it's finding a fulfilling job. Yeah. You know, I had a guy reach out to me today telling me about. Um, so he came back, you know, and his thoughts are what many other veterans have is, am I ever going to do anything even nearly as important as I just did overseas? You know what I mean? Is this going to be the the most important thing I ever did? And honestly, it, it may be, but if yeah, you have I was that, I'm going to say probably not, was but, my, but if you have thinking. that, if you have that mindset of, I'm never going to do anything worth the shit anymore, it's, yeah. it's depressing. It's going to take I'm you down 26, there. I'm 26. I'm out of the army, out of the Marines, out of the Navy, out of the Air Force. Right. And I'm never, I could teach school and change life, but I'm never going to say, I'm never going to pull a guy by his collar and watch a bullet ricochet off a, a tire of a, a Humvee and save his life. Right. A yeah. band of brothers style. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, oh, I mean, I, 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 I know that's tough and of course there's just a weird, that's just a tough conversation, you know, veterans and, 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 and many civilians, it's just, they feel like they won't relate to each other, I think. And so they don't, they don't have these conversations, you know, but, uh, and they just feel like they, they, they can't work together. I think a lot of times and that, uh, where do people go? What, what are things people can do that listen to my podcast to help veterans, tangible things? Like a lot of people are business owners. They can't hire, you know, a second Lieutenant just coming back from uh, the sandbox over there in Afghanistan. Where, what are charities that you know where the money will, if I put $10 in $10 going exactly where that $10 is supposed to go. I know, you know, some, yeah, I know, you know, some that are, you know, we won't mention, a little iffy, right. like we don't know where the money's. It's a little here and there. What are some challenges? Yeah. That well, people- the the ones the ones that I'm excited about right now, and there's a million more that I'm, or not a million, but there's probably a thousand more that I don't know about and I'm missing. And but the ones that I've been involved with, and people reach out to me, and I've talked to them, are all about empowering veterans and enriching veterans' lives. It's not just saving them, you know what I mean, or or helping out uh, guys that need help, you know, that are wounded and stuff like that. And obviously that is super freaking important. And a lot of these guys fall under this category too, you know, empowering those guys that, Hey, you know, you, you may not be, uh, you're obviously not gonna be the same when you went over there, when you come back, whether that's mental or physical, uh, maybe you lost something, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's about, I mean, there's like, like, uh, honor, courage, commitment, which is uh, hcc.com. It's part of that 22 kill. Their whole thing is about like veteran entrepreneurship and they're like a lot of the money that's donated, they're helping veterans start these, start their businesses, you know, whatever it is. And they're very obviously picky and choosy and they don't, they're just giving people money. Yeah. Uh, but that's just, that's one With thing. Karate instance. dojo with a tanning salon in it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, you got it, Colonel. Here's a hundred grand. Yeah. You got it, Colonel. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I picked the highest ranking guy I could think of under general, a real numbskull. <laughs> Like, like yeah. Travolta and Thin Red Line. Right, right, right. <laughs> Dope. Yes. Yeah. So what's the name of that website? That's that's uh, Honor, Courage, Commitment, hcc.com. But then there's also, there's uh, Team RWB, Team Red, White, and Blue. And that's uh, that one's like, 
I mean, th- like fitness and stuff like that. And, you know, doing stuff like this, that's, that's what guys need to do to, to assimilate back to normalcy here. You know, you got to do those fitness? things. Yeah. Staying in shape. Guys get back. How am I going to help? I'm being serious. Like how, like <laughs> I'm raising my eyebrows. Like how am I going to help a guy that did two tours in Iraq stay in shape? Like what? I, I can barely curl these thirties. Well, you don't have to spot him. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's uh, there here, there's one off the top of my head is one called catch a lift and it's like, they help pay for gym memberships for some of these guys that, can, that oh. maybe can't afford it. You know, maybe they, they come back and especially if you didn't retire out at 20 years out, you know, you got wife and kids and stuff and you don't make that much when you're in, it's tough to pay for those type of things, you know, and then guys get out of shape and they get on health, get on their, their health goes downhill and they're Depressed. unhappy and yeah, exactly. It's just snowballs, you know? Yeah. And sometimes a lot of times they're over medicated, you know, or they're taking the wrong stuff. I mean, it's just, it's so hard because there's so many of them and there's just not that many resources and there's just not that much money. You know, yeah. the VA is kind of a mess right now. And the it's VA, a mess know, is an understatement. Yeah. And it, that's a whole other, we could talk for an hour about the right. VA and how it's, it's very embarrassing that the veterans administration uh, is run the way it is. And John Stewart, uh, I would say once a week, just fucking hammers the VA. You seen it ever? I haven't, but I've heard. He's got I've heard photos yeah. of the inside of the building of the stacks of boxes of case wow. files and shit, and like the Dewey Decimal System bullshit that they're using to help the veterans get their uh, medical care. Right. Like he puts them on blast at least once a week. Fuck, and I don't mean like makes a joke about it. I right. mean like tears in his eyes. Fucking hammers the wow. VA. It's embarrassing. It's yeah. horrible. So you guys deserve better, and you women deserve better yep. 22 kill 22 kill.com 22 veterans kill themselves every day and when you told me that it blew my mind it absolutely blew my mind brother now me too. and i don't have the answers that's another point you i don't, don't have know. the answers but, but someone pro- listening but, might but have the answers just like in darfur <laughs> you got a shovel in the dirt and you're you're, you're moving something around here yeah i'm doing that's what all, i can i'm just helping get do. the word out and that's and, it you're doing <laughs> listen to me yeah just like in darfur you didn't know what the hell you're doing it's true but you got started Right, and you move some dirt around. Somebody said, "Put that table, put it over there." Yeah. And at the end of the result, you said something about an hour ago. Played with kids. Who knew? Well, you said that. I smiled so big. I don't think you caught it because you were in your own head trying to recall the memory. <laughs> right. And I thought, how big? Out of all the humanitarian aid, the fact that a guy, Nate Boyer, an American, with all these Belgian weirdos <laughs> running around, like when did they ever get involved in it? He's eating right? waffles and stuff. Yeah, they're eating waffles. Bella, the French, like, did you know? You know. You played with children. And yeah. I guarantee you that was more effective in the long run than a bag of rice being dropped out of a Huey. Right. You know? So right. what you're doing now, I don't expect you to have the answers, but I appreciate you having a shovel in the dirt and, uh, you know, playing with kids and getting this shit talked about and coming right. on the podcast and airing it out. And I right. know you're not a guy that wants to talk about himself a lot. Right. I know that's your well, personality. Well, back to me anyway. Yeah, let's talk more about Nate. <laughs> Nate has a tryout for the San Francisco 49ers. By the time this airs, you may or may not be the long snapper for the San Francisco 49ers. I probably will not be by the time this airs. It's still down the road. That's, I got a long way I to could, go. I could shelve it. I got a long way to go. I could shelve this episode <laughs> until you make a team and then just go like, wow. And by the way, congratulations <laughs> on making the Jaguars click. <laughs> Cue the meatloaf. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. <laughs> Any chance at all of going back overseas if the NFL doesn't work out? There's always a chance of that. I mean, you guys can't. You just, seem like the first generation of guys that can't get it out of your system. Well, first of all, it's, for better for, for a worse. lot of these, for a lot of guys, you know, take a guy that's 30 years old right now. If he joined when he was 18, that's all he knows. Yeah, he's been over there back and forth. I, I met, I met a, uh, a ranger on my last deployment over there. It was just thirteenth deployment. Isn't that insane? Yeah, because he goes he, back home to Ontario, California, and he gets a job at a Subway sandwich shop, and the fluorescent lights are killing him. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I mean, a weird world. It's so like a radiohead just, video. I mean, it's so that's yeah. Like I mean, like like we were talking about earlier, and like this issue, and why and why that's why that no, that's why the number is twenty two. You know what I mean? Because that's a, all the, a lot of these guys have known. It's like when guys get out of prison. I was, you know. Doing straight time. Yeah. I was holding it in because I was waiting there you for you go. to finish. There you I was go. like, when you go to prison, you come out, all of a sudden doing straight time is like this, like, what am I doing? I just walk down the street. Nobody yeah. bothers me. Right. I can make a left or a right. 
I can dress, wear whatever I want. Yeah. I can just walk through this park. Right. So it's like that with uh, with combat. Guys. Right. And a lot of them want they want to go back. Right. I mean, you're, a lot of guys get out of prison are like they don't know what to do. Like was, in Generation Kill, he uh, he did a really good job uh, of saying this is the first generation of soldiers that assume they're being lied to, but you know they're from rural, you know, Alabama. Job prospects, you know, what am I going to work at the bait shop like my right. dad did? I don't want to work in a coal mine if I live in, uh, you know, uh, wherever coal is. I don't know what the fuck it is. West Virginia? Pittsburgh? I don't know. Oh, yeah, they're about. <laughs> You're right in the neighborhood. Yes, sir. Yes, Sergeant. Nate. <laughs> so they go, if I join, this is on my resume forever. I got a little bit of money I can count on forever. And then when they come back, the, like you are the first generation of uh, soldiers that are like, you know what? I'm going to go back. Everyone else is like, you weren't there, man. <laughs> and those guys are legit, you know, as legit, if not more legit than anybody. Because, right. you know, that was brand new uh, what those guys went through. Right. But you guys, hats off. And what am I doing? Uh, I'll tell you off, Mike. Because that was your question to the person in the airport. Right. For, thank you for saying thank you. But what are you doing for that thing? Well, I mean, but buddy, Hackett besides what you tell me off, Mike, I mean, just the fact that we're having this conversation, it's going to reach, uh, what, 20,000 million people? A million. 200 million people. No, 1 million, Nate. Every 1. Monday. 1.9 million, million, million people. You got it. <laughs> now you get it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's huge right there. Because, it, that's, like I said, the more ears that get this stuff and... Uh, you know, it just it, it's going to motivate someone to just click on the internet, and then it's going to lead to something, and someone's going to get. A when shopping for car insurance, consider this: Geico has been saving people money on car insurance for over seventy-five years. So if you're serious about savings, it's simple: go to Geico.com. After seventy-five years, they know how to save you money. I think you guys will really dig this. Nate Boyer, uh, Green Beret, Special Forces, United States Army, three tours of Afghanistan and v uh, Vietnam and Iraq, um, and uh, played uh, football at the University of Texas, but never played football before he tried in college. And I'm very proud to put this up today, Monday, uh, because over the weekend, Nate Boyer became the long snapper. He signed with the Seattle Seahawks. So uh, it, it's just it, mind-blowing, mind-blowing how cool it is that this guy left Afghanistan, went back to the University of Texas and said, I'm going to make the football team. Let me see. Long snapper. Yeah, I'll try it. Uh, you'll dig it. Fascinating guy and uh, a little slow to get going because I don't think he's used to being on his heels uh, the way I ask him questions, but just an incredible story. Nate Boyer, long snapper, Seattle Seahawks. And this uh, was recorded a week ago before he knew he was going to be pulling an NFL check. Way to go, Nate. Thank you for your service. And now make sure you snap the ball the right way, buddy. All right, there's some more stories, people. Let's go. Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game tape. Donuts. If you wanna battle, it's either that you will or you won't. You know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Hey, man. Ready? Uh, more stories podcast. Uh, pick up your mic there, Nate Boyer. Nate Boyer, my man. Staff Sergeant. I'd call you sir, but I know you work for a living. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that like, uh, that's what they always say. in the face. That's what they say in the army. If <laughs> yeah, you're a yeah. sergeant and yeah. somebody calls you sir, it's like, whoa. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Nate Boyer is an army special forces uh, guy. Uh, Green Bray is the slang. But also, you have to, you know. Also, Nate Boyer, uh, well, I'll, we're going to get to the story. It's pretty intense. And uh, Nate Boyer was the long snapper at University of Texas. You got to hold that mic real close to your uh, face. 
there, buddy. Where were you right before you came here? Just now? Yeah. Uh, I was at my internship getting coffee, you know, getting coffee and picking up lunch. And Can I ask uh, you a question? <laughs> How many tours of duty did you do in Afghanistan slash Iraq? Uh, three total. So three tours. Why are you getting coffee for anybody? <laughs> we should be handing you coffee and fanning you and uh, having Filipino <laughs> women feeding you grapes. Well, that's that's coming. That's soon uh, on the horizon. But yeah, I had to... Uh, you got to put your time in no matter where it is. You know, you got to go back to, to the beginning and I'm, you know, eventually want to, uh, you know, work in the film business, I believe. And so I'm interning at uh, a place called Film 44. It's Peter Berg's production company. Good dude. And, yeah. Great guy. Great director. Great director. And g- a good person, you know, big veteran supporter, much like you. Uh, funny guy. Not quite, not quite Jay Moore funny, but you know, oh, he's funny. Is, That's on. true. Good point. But yeah. So, I mean, so you wait, gotta, if you, you want to get somewhere. into the film industry... You took a very circuitous route. Three tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. You joined the Army. You're in Texas. You, I mean, why not just uh, go to University of Texas and go to film school? Uh, I kind of wanted to, but I really wanted to play football, and it was pretty much impossible to do both. I wouldn't say impossible because I guess people have done it, but uh, I tried to do it for my graduate degree. I tried to do the film degree, and uh, they told me that you know, I, had, I had the best – references you could have i had great grades and you know i thought i had a pretty interesting background and uh but they said no because on the weekends you got to film stuff and you know we got football games in the fall it's a tank this is nate's tank yeah that just went by <laughs> no just i'm around the back i'm talking about before you joined the united states army uh you knew you wanted to be oh yeah no i wanted to go to film school then yeah it's yeah. expensive and instead you decided to serve our country right was yeah, there, was was it because of nine eleven that you decided to go all in, or was it after that? Yeah, I mean it, that's where it started. Honestly, when I went to yeah, walk the listener through the okay. whole thought process of where you got you know to you know right. basic. Okay, so um, I was living out here. You know, after high school, I went down to San Diego and had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to work for a living and you know earn my keep, and I wanted to work outside and have you know do some sort of manual labor and just feel like you know, a man, I guess. And so I, I got, I, I weaseled my way onto a fishing boat as a deckhand and did that for a while. And, uh, it was fun. It was crazy. You know, we'd go out in the hundred miles out, uh, offshore and, uh, you know, catch albacore and tuna and bluefin and whatever. And, uh, and then I moved up here cause I wanted to go to film school and it's expensive. I wasn't going to ask my parents for, for money to go. And so I just didn't, didn't really go, you know, I was living here and I was partying a lot and, uh, just doing odd jobs, really no direction, had no clue still what, what I really wanted to do in this business. And, uh, and then nine 11 happened and it just completely flipped my world upside down and totally changed, uh, changed my thinking on things and kind of got me thinking outside of my bubble and I guess more globally. And, uh, eventually that led me to the Darfur in, in Africa and I did some relief work there for a couple months. And while I was over there is where before I gained. Before you were in the army. Before the army, yeah. So when I was there, I, I, I so I tried to get on with an NGO to go over there. I read this Time Magazine article. NGO stands for uh, non government non government organization. Yeah, everything's an acronym in the military. So right. Help yeah, us yeah, out. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's like uh, Doctors Without Borders yeah, and yeah. Child Fund and whatever. So I called them all, and they were like, you know, you, you got to have a college degree, and it's like a six month vetting process and all like stuff. I'm trying I'm like I just want to help yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want that too one day yeah but I mean I was like I, I'll I just want to get over there I'll do whatever I'll do whatever I just I'll fly myself over there you know I just want to help out and uh yeah they they just said no pretty much so I said no and I applied for a visa through the consulate through DC and just like sent it in the mail and said I was going over there with some organization that I wasn't going with. And they sent me back my passport with like a visa sticker on it and I was good to go. So I went and bought a plane ticket for Darfur. For the Chad. Yeah. It's a country next to Sudan. Yeah. And where all the refugee camps were. And I just flew there and then I weaseled my way onto a UN flight and flew to the refugee camps and helped out for a couple months. <laughs> I don't think people in, I know for a fact people in this country have any idea how I only know about it through reading books. Um, what a concept, uh, how I'll when you go to there. those refugee camps, it's, it, it makes you question like the entire human race and what, like how people could suffer the way the suffering you saw, right. uh, especially in Darfur. And uh, do you, 
do you get to the point when you're working with the UN with refugees in Darfur and there's like an insurgency in Chad and these weird border wars and these drug wars? Do you ever get to the point where you think to yourself, I've been here six months, nothing is helping at all? Or do you see personal like stories of triumph in those places? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of where my want to join the army came from, honestly. And I didn't know that was going to happen. I went over there, you know, thinking I'm going to. Uh, you know, I'm going to save somebody. I just, I, all I want to do is save one person and really help some, you know, help people over there. And I go over there and, you know, most of the stuff I did was I, I assisted in the the medical centers and I, you know, I played with kids and just spent time with people. You know, there was, there's no Americans over there. It was all, all the, all the people working over there were either locals or they were from, um, from Belgium. Most of them, you know, everybody's, it's a French speaking country. So everyone's speaking French. And so this American shows up, I had like this seersucker coat and, uh, just these khakis and I had nothing. I had like a change of underwear and a toothbrush and uh, malaria pills in my bag, you know? And it was just like, who, you know, what is this guy doing? Who is this guy? But then they found out I was an American and they just, oh man, they just gravitated towards it. You know, they all wanted to hear about America and how amazing it is. And, you know, they just were like, oh, it's so great. You come here. Did George Bush send you here? You know, and all these things. I mean, <laughs> do I you know like, George Bush? Yeah. Do you know George Bush? Yeah. You want we to like him? this. We love this George Bush. You want me to call him? <laughs> we love this man. It, it was just things you didn't expect to hear. You know, I, I kind of was under the impression that uh, it may be really dangerous for me and maybe they're going to, some of the people there might, you know, hate me because I'm American or just that, that jealousy or whatever, but I never felt that at all. It was like generosity. Did you see uh, drug lords like struggling for power of the UN stuff? Because, I mean, uh, Black Hawk Down, historically, we went in there, Clinton sent everybody, you know this already. Right, yeah. We went in there because the drug lord, uh, lords in Somalia were taking all the UN supplies and right. starving the people. That was their power. So we went in to save everybody, and uh, shit went south in a hurry. And to his credit, Bill Clinton went, everybody out. Right. Not wanted, not needed. So right. long. Right. Have fun. Uh, did you see drug lord stuff going down when you were working with the UN in Darfur? Um, I didn't firsthand. So what was happening there really was uh, it's this militia called the Janjaweed. And it was basically, it's just a genocide. It was just an ethnic war, you know. And these 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 people would come into this. These guys would come in on horseback in these villages, and they would like rape all the women, and you know, maim the, some of the kids, and either kill the, the fathers or, or you know or the or the dads would escape and end up fighting anyway, and uh, and then they would just burn the village to the ground and leave. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. You know, I I wasn't firsthand on the front line seeing that happen, but I saw the the uh, the after effects. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I'm, these kids are like missing limbs, you know, and their faces are all cut up and they're it out there. It seems to be a big thing in Africa, taking off a hand or a foot. It's, yeah, it's crazy. You can curse, by the way. I, I see you uh, <laughs> choosing your words carefully. Let fly. This is okay. the internet. All right. So you're in Darfur. You're doing uh, relief work uh, in a refugee camp with only one other American. How do you then go into the United States Army? So, yeah, it's like the end of my trip over there and... I'm like, I, I just wanted to keep helping somehow. And I didn't know exactly how or what, but like I said, I kind of gained that patriotism over there and just a, an appreciation of who I was in an, as an American for the first time. I was really proud of that, you know, um, just because of the way they looked up to me. And I even met got young men over there, young, you know, Chadians and Sudanese that were like, I wish I could join the army, the American army. You know, like I want to, I want to join the army because you guys go to these countries and you, you know, you help people like us that, you know, can't fight for ourselves and blah, blah, blah. Plus you eat three hots and a cot. And you eat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you get citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so yes, there's that. But I mean, they were, yeah, they were just like, that was so, I don't know. I mean, they were, they were interested in that. It wasn't just what they would get. It's just what kind of we stand for. At least that's what they told me. Maybe they're, so you, maybe they're good lives. You have a self, <laughs> you have, you have a feeling of self and uh, an identity of self. Once you're helping people, you want to continue to help people. You want to be of service. So you go to, a, did you just walk into a recruiter's office? It's exactly what I did. Really? I, yeah, I came back here. I came back here and I was like, okay, I want to join the military. I don't know what I want to do exactly though. And then I, I picked up another magazine uh, because it was saying something about special forces on the front and I read 